Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back to another episode from Project IUC. Now we will be continuing on with our seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And in episode 13, we will be discussing the first emigration to Abyssinia. So continuing on with the seerah, the next incident that we're going to talk about was the major incident of the first emigration to Abyssinia. So when these tactics of torture and humiliation continued, the Prophet peace be upon him suggested to the Sahaba, this land has become too constricted for you. So for those of you who want to, why don't you emigrate to the neighboring land of Abyssinia? For there is a Christian king there who is a just king. He shall allow you to worship without interference. And this was announced in Rajab in the fifth year of the Da'wah. So we recall the da'wah went public in the third year, and this announcement was made less than one and a half years later. So all of the torture we talked about happened in these one and a half years. It got so difficult that the Prophet peace be upon him allowed the Sahaba to emigrate. Now as a Qurayshi, you had to be linked to Mecca because of the concept of tribalism. If you went anywhere else, you had no honor or protection because there was no law or government or civilization. You became a second or third class citizen. On top of that, there was no bank transfer for your property. You couldn't sell it because you couldn't tell anybody you were leaving. When they performed Hijrah to Medina in the later series that we'll discuss, the Sahaba suffered immensely in financial loss even the rich Sahaba, because you could not take their money with them. It was too dangerous to carry your gold and silver with you. And so, when you are making Hijrah, you are entering into a strange world with no honor, protection, and you are at the mercy of those around you. Now, to make matters even worse, it's a land in Africa, where the people don't even speak Arabic. The culture is completely different. So this shows how difficult Mecca must have been for them that they preferred to go to Abyssinia over staying in Mecca. When the Prophet peace be upon him gave this command, 15 people migrated in total, 11 men and 4 women. Among them was Uthman ibn Affan and his wife Ruqayya, the daughter of the Prophet peace be upon him. And he was followed by Abdullah al-Rahman ibn Auf and Uthman ibn Maz'oon, Zubair ibn al-Awwam, Musab ibn Umair, and Abu Sulaima and his wife Umm Sulaima. She was left all alone without any support. When Abu when Abu Sulaima died in Abyssinia later on, so out of her, so out of mercy to her, the Prophet peace be upon him sent a proposal to Umm Sulaima. And then there was also a number of other Sahaba who also migrated. It's unclear whether they all secretly emigrated or whether it was known. Some reports seem to indicate that they left secretly. They made their way to Jeddah, which is now known as Jeddah, and then took a ship to Abyssinia. Other reports seem to suggest that news reached the Quraysh. This is also acceptable as at the time there was no reason for the Quraysh to stop them. And there is one report in the Mujam of Al-Tabarani, the book of Hadith, which suggests that the news was public. The story involves one of the couples. No, there were four couples who migrated, Amir ibn Rabiya and his wife Layla. They were one of them. It was narrated that Layla packed her bags and loaded the camel. Umar, who was not yet a Muslim at the time, passed by and saw that they are traveling. So he asked, where are you traveling to? As it was not the season of Rihlat, al shitai wa Al-Saif, the winter and the summer trips. Now traveling was a massive deal for them. It's not a normal thing. Layla was understandably so irritated and said, this is all because of you and your terrorizing persecution of us just because we want to worship Allah. Because of you, we have to go somewhere else and find the land where we can worship Allah in. Instead of getting angry, Umar showed compassion and said, Has the matter reached that level? May Allah be with you. And he walked on his way. Layla was completely flabbergasted. 
So when her husband comes home, she told him about this. Her husband snorted in contempt and said, Do you really think he will be merciful to us and accept Islam? The donkeys of his father's house will embrace Islam before he does. Subhanallah, this shows us Umar had an outer hardness, but inside he was a very compassionate and soft person. Ummi Salama narrated in first person in Bukhari, We began to live in a good land with good neighbors and we were safe with regards to our religions and did not have fear of any persecution. Notice everyone who migrated were all high status Qurayshi people. Why couldn't the lower status emigrate? Well, firstly because they were slaves. They did not have the political luxury to emigrate. This shows us that the people who needed to emigrate the most were unable to do so. And these people consisted of Bilal, Khabab, Ibn Mas'ud, Amr, and a lot more. And the more elite Muslims like Uthman ibn Affan, who in later series was one of the Muslims who was sent to Hudaybiyyah because everyone knew the Quraysh would never hurt him as they loved him so much. And this shows us a person does not have to take care of himself. As the Quran says in chapter 5, 105. The elites were not as persecuted as the rest, but they had an opportunity to have less persecution, so they availed themselves to the opportunity. There was no point for them to stay and be persecuted. And there was nothing un-Islamic about this, even though there were people who needed to emigrate worse than them. But you make the best of bad situation. Whoever can leave and be whoever can leave and be emigrated, they did so. Now there is a maxim in fiqh which says if you cannot save anybody then take a path of lesser of the two evils. So now let's discuss some of the benefits that we can derive from the Muslims in Abyssinia. So not all of the lands of the non-Muslims were the same. Some of the lands of the non-Muslims were peaceful and could be inhabited to worship Allah in peace and others were hostile. Mecca and Abyssinia were not the same. There were lands where freedom is guaranteed and there were lands where people were persecuted. So in our religion, we have a clear-cut political notion that there are certain lands where we, allow, where we are allowed to, to be or in fact where we should live, provided we can worship Allah in that land. If we have this freedom, we should remain law-abiding citizens of that land. The model of the Abyssinian Muslims is a model where Muslims living in the Western world. Even as we know that no two things are exactly the same, but overall there is a motto. And the model is, you live as a minority in a majority non-Muslim land, and you obey the laws of the land, and you understand that you are a citizen under the government of the land, and you don't intend to overthrow the constitution or the government. The Abyssinian Muslims did not plot and plan to overthrow Najashi. They just lived, worshipped and practiced in the community without any problems. Now many extremists say it's haram to live in America. In response we say the Muslims lived in Abyssinia and their goal was nothing but to worship Allah and they were remained there for over a decade. In fact for 14 years Seven years after the Hijrah, the Muslims were still in Abyssinia. It was only after the Battle of Khaybar in seven after Hijrah that the Prophet peace be upon him sent a letter to Jafir in Abyssinia and told them to come back to Medina. This shows there was a community of believers living in Abyssinia even when there was a fully functioning Darul Islam in Medina. Also notice the Prophet peace be upon him described Najashi of Abyssinia, the emperor of Abyssinia named Ashama ibn Abjar as a just king. Why? Because he did not persecute his subjects nor did he interfere in their religion. Allowing people freedom in worship is considered to be a just act.
Now, what are some of the wisdoms of why Abyssinia was chosen as a land for the Muslims to migrate to? Well, firstly, the king of Abyssinia was a just king that allowed freedom of worship. Abyssinia was familiar to the Quraysh and Muslims due to trade that happened between them. It wasn't as if the Prophet peace be upon him said go to China, somewhere the Muslims had never heard of. It was an easy passage. The journey to Judah only took one and a half day, not too far. And from there, it was a ship to Abyssinia, which took five to seven hours. So within two days, you could be in Abyssinia, much closer than even Yemen or Rome. Now, number four, they were Christians, not pagans. Christians are much closer to Muslims. In fact, Allah says in the Quran in chapter five, verse 82, and you will find the nearest of them in affections to the believers, those who say we are Christian. That is because among them are priests and monks and because they are not arrogant. And it's also said a theory that Najashi was following a version of Christianity that was in the Trinitarian version we have today. So shortly after the emigration to Abyssinia, the Muslims came back to Mecca. It's narrated that they came back in the month of Shawwal. There were about 15 people who emigrated and they all came back. What happened to cause them to change their mind and come back to the very land of torture? They migrated in Rajab but came back just three months later. Now the reason for this was due to a famous incident that occurred. Some call this incident the incident of the satanic verses. They returned back because of one rumor, and that was that the Quraysh had accepted Islam. Indeed, for anyone, the most difficult time of moving is the first few months. When you do not have a house and don't have any friends, you are not settled down. It's so different from what you're used to. Different languages, different cultures, and much more. It's very difficult. And so some rumors spread that they, had pr that they had pounced on and they embraced. And that rumor was that the Quraysh had actually accepted Islam. No matter how wild it sounded, their hearts were yearning to go back to Mecca. So they decided to pack their bags and go all the way back, as they had no way to verify the rumor. On the way there, they discovered the rumor to be false. The basis of the rumor was that was what some call the satanic verses. This is the version reported in Zahi Bukhari, thus the most authentic. And it says in this hadith that in the month of Ramadan, the month is not mentioned in Bukhari, but we learn from but we learn this from Ibn Isha. In the fifth year of the Da'wah, the Prophet peace be upon him recited Surah Al Najm in its entirety. It's a very powerful and eloquent surah. The momentum and the excitement builds up especially towards the end. The power of the Quran affected the entire congregation, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, such that when the Prophet peace be upon him recited the last verse, prostrate to Allah and worship him, the Muslims fell into sajda and the Quraysh were so emotional that they too fell into sajda. For the first time, Muslims and non-Muslims all united behind the Prophet peace be upon him, except for Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira, or in another version, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, who put sand to his head and said, this is good enough for me. By the time this news reached this 15 Sahaba in Abyssinia, the rumor had, uh, that the rumor had been exaggerated. This is the version that was narrated in Bukhari, a simple story. And that concludes this video of the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Inshallah ta'ala, we will continuing on with this story in the later episodes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.